you know, if raising animals for food is the leading cause of Amazon destruction, why isn't Amazon Watch or Rainforest Action Network, why isn't that their forefront issue? It would be like talking about uh, lung cancer without ever talking about smoking. It's time to change the world. There's got to be a better way. It's time for something better. You feel like you can't really make a difference, but the fact is that you can. We're telling the stories of people who are changing the world and how you can help. You know, we just need more companies that are out there solving these problems. Businesses, nonprofits, artists, and individuals who have found a problem and then created a solution. If we want to have real impact, we have to do it together. You'll come away from every episode with action steps you can take to be part of that solution. We're never going to feel satisfied and happy if we just stay the same. We can each change the world every single day. People can actually come together and build a future for themselves along with other people. Our daily actions have a massive impact. So what will we do about it? We can remake the world. Because guess what? We can. Hi, everyone. I'm Nathan Gardner, and this is We Can Remake the World, a podcast about people who are changing the world and how you can help. Thanks for being here with us today. Our episode is a big one, and there's lots to cover, so I'm going to dive right in. The fine dining world just changed overnight. Eleven Madison Park in New York City is widely known as one of the best restaurants in the world, and they've just made a huge announcement. When they reopen in June, after closing for over a year due to COVID-19, they will no longer serve meat, seafood, or dairy. No animals, no animal products. Eleven Madison Park is one of only 132 restaurants in the entire world with three Michelin stars, the top award for any restaurant. The number of vegan restaurants on that list? Zero. So why is head chef Daniel Hume taking this huge risk? Especially after a time where his restaurant was in jeopardy due to the financial difficulties of the pandemic. Recently, Chef Hume was a guest on the How I Built This podcast, and he said there, and I'm quoting, The way we have sourced our food, the way we are consuming our food, the way we eat meat, it is not sustainable. And that is not an opinion, this is just a fact. So we decided that our restaurant will be 100% plant-based. End quote. On the 11 Madison Park website, Chef Hume writes, It's time to redefine luxury as an experience that serves a higher purpose and maintains a genuine connection to the community. We are thrilled to share the incredible possibilities of plant-based cuisine while deepening our connection to our homes, both our city and our planet. This is big. Again, this has never been done, where a top-rated restaurant has gone fully plant-based. What are the facts that Chef Hume referenced? What's going on when it comes to animal agriculture and how it relates to sustainability and the health of our planet? That's what we'll explore on today's episode. There is a realization that's been taking shape over the last 10 to 15 years or so when it comes to how we eat and what that means for our planet. The resources that we invest into the production of meat, seafood, and dairy for human consumption are massive, and more and more people are talking about it. As the demand for meat consumption around the world goes up, it's easy to see that the massive amount of resources we're putting into producing meat and dairy won't last. If I asked you, what's the leading contributor of greenhouse gases in the entire world? gases which impact our atmosphere and cause global temperatures to rise. What would you say? Cars? That's usually most people's first guess, I think. Airplanes? Energy consumption in general? Fossil fuels in general? All wrong. It's animal agriculture. The industries which raise and harvest animals for slaughter, for human consumption, cause over half of all greenhouse gas emissions globally. This blew my mind the first time I heard it. And what blew my mind even more is the massive impact animal agriculture has on our planet beyond greenhouse gases. It's also the leading cause of deforestation, causing 91% of destruction in the Amazon rainforest as the trees are cleared to raise and graze cattle. 
It's the leading cause of ocean destruction, the leading cause of species extinction globally, and the top consumer of Earth's fresh water. We're feeding cows, pigs, and chickens huge amounts of grains and water that could be going to people who are starving and thirsty around the world. And in many cases, the way we're treating these animals that we're raising for slaughter is anything but humane, if you look at industrial farming. One of the earliest and loudest voices in this growing movement to re-examine how we relate to our food and how we produce it was the team behind the Netflix documentary Cowspiracy. In the film, we follow Kip, the co-director of the film, on a journey of discovery as he realizes that the single most destructive industry on the planet for the environment is animal agriculture. And as Kip discovers this truth and tries to speak with environmental and regulatory groups about it, he's ignored, or the facts are avoided altogether. But now the truth is out. If we want to maintain a healthy planet and have healthier people, we've got to change the way we eat and the way we produce food. For our conversation today, we're joined by Keegan Kuhn, co-director and co-producer of Cowspiracy. Keegan was kind enough to join us to speak about the experience of creating the film, why he thinks it's imperative that we change our food systems and our food habits, and what we can do to protect the planet with every meal we eat. So thanks so much for speaking with me, Keegan. I think that the conversation that Cowspiracy has created is extremely important. And I'd like to start with the core problem that's raised by the film, which is that most of us are completely unaware of the largest contributor to climate change and environmental destruction. What is the leading cause of climate change? Yeah, so the leading cause of climate change is human beings. That's the yeah. that's the, the real answer. Um, but it's how human beings live their lives and decide to use industry. One of the leading causes of anthropogenic greenhouse gases is animal agriculture, raising animals for food. But it's not just raising those animals, it's raising all the feed crops that go into feeding those animals. It's clearing all the forest that needs to be cleared to make grazing room or land that needs to be cleared to grow the crops to feed those animals. It goes on and on. It's the transportation, it's the refrigeration, it's, there's so many elements that tie into the full life cycle analysis of animal products. So animal agriculture is by far one of the leading causes of human-caused greenhouse gases. And then you can go down the list and ask a similar question. What is the leading cause of, as you said a bit already, rainforest destruction, leading cause of species extinction, leading cause of ocean dead zones where life has just disappeared because of pollution-related runoff and things like that? I mean, what else as far as what animal agriculture touches? It's pretty much anything you could care about in the environmental world. Animal agriculture plays a negative role. And yeah, topsoil erosion, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, desertification. I mean, literally anything you could care about. And, and you, you know, you have people who really care about wolves, right? Well, what's the reason wolves were pushed to the brink of extinction? It was the livestock industry. These animals were predating on sheep and calves. And so the livestock industry pushed to kill all of them. You care about whales. Well, what's the leading cause of whale death? Well, it's, it's not Japanese or Norwegian whalers. It's actually whales dying in fishing nets. It's whales dying from ingesting plastic. But the biggest cause is it's plastic from fishing nets, which is a form of animal agriculture. You know, there's really nothing that you could think about in the environmental world that animal agriculture doesn't play a role. I mean, the, the leading cause of Great Barrier Reef die-off is from animal agriculture. You know, so it's just like it just goes on and on and on. It's it's such a massive industry and has such a huge footprint that it touches everything. It's so interesting because until this moment, even after having watched Cowspiracy a couple of times, the idea that fishing is included in animal agriculture didn't quite register with me. It's so interesting, I think, that because the oceans are less visible, we don't necessarily lump them into the category of livestock or raising poultry for chicken and eggs. I just think that's really interesting. Yeah, and, and, and the fishing industry, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily consider fishing part of animal agriculture, but it directly ties into it. You know, animal agriculture uses a tremendous amount of fish and fish meal in feeding livestock. So pigs actually consume more fish in the United States than human beings do. Um, chickens are fed a tremendous amount of fish and fish byproducts. And then the whole agricultural sector, particularly the organic agricultural sector, uses a tremendous amount of fish and fish meal in as a fertilizer. 
So what we do to the planet and other animals is all connected. And so I would lump it all together as part of animal agriculture. And that raises another interesting point too. I think that's, it's sort of easy to be out of sight, out of mind a little bit about it. Not that it's out of sight, but just to not make the link between what we feed our pets. We're also feeding our own pets, you know, animals that have been raised for consumption. And that's a whole, uh, that's gotta be huge. I haven't looked up the numbers. It yet, is but. huge. It's um, if our pets were their own country, of ranking countries for the largest impact to climate change, pets would be number six on impact wow. for the world. If they were their own country, they have such a huge impact. And so there's phenomenal companies like Wild Earth, which is producing plant-based uh, pet foods, hmm. um, you know, the vet-approved, you know, science-based to try and lower the impact because it is it's such a massive thing. It's not just like a small thing. But the truth is, is that most pet food is the byproducts of animal agriculture. So it's not like they're necessarily right. raising animals just to feed to pets. It's they're raising animals for human beings, and then the uh, animals that aren't deemed food grade for human beings is that are then fed to animals and all the byproducts. So it's pretty horrible stuff. I just think it's something that's so easy for most folks to just like not kind of like you see a piece of meat in the store and it's easy to completely disconnect from the fact that it came from a live animal. This, I think, is one step beyond. It's like... We're just so used to those dried food pellets as being so ubiquitous. We don't think about where they came from and what goes into the meat or byproducts that are involved there. And I think that's um, part of the whole system is that we're we're intentionally detached from where the products come from. And that's not just with animal products. That's with everything. It's with our shoes, our clothes, you know, our cars, anything that we consume, we're intentionally not allowed to see the whole supply chain. And then with food products in particular, we don't call them the side of a cow. We don't call it baby chicken. We don't call it baby lamb. We call it, you know, it's a hot dog. It's beef. It's, you know, something else. We don't call it by what it really is. Yeah, that's a really good point. When I watched Cowspiracy for the first time, of course, I think as anyone would be, I was in total shock just because of how far reaching this specific problem is. And the fact that I'd never heard almost any of it before. I mean, when you and your co-director and co-writer and Kip created the film. What was your journey as far as waking up to these truths? You know, what was your guys' experience with that? We knew that the situation was bad. We knew that animal agriculture played a role in environmental destruction, but I don't think Kip, my co-director for the film, and I really knew how bad it truly was. And as we started digging, as we started doing more research, as we started talking to more experts and researchers, it became clear how devastating. You know, according to two environmental advisors to the World Bank, Raising animals for food is responsible for up to 51% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And, you know, that's astronomical. That's the leading cause. Um, and that's a peer-reviewed study that has gotten a lot of criticism, but that study has held up to the test of time when other people have replicated it. And, you know, yet that's not on the forefront. You know, the United Nations would say it's 14.5% of anthropogenic greenhouse gases come from animal agriculture. So there, there's a huge variance. But if you look at the entire system, you look at all the things all of the elements of the environment and full life cycle analysis, animal agriculture is at the forefront and it is astronomical. And that's, I think, one of the failings of the environmental movement and also of researchers in general, and this isn't just for environmental researchers, is that people tend to be kind of siloed. They're focused on just climate change or they're focused on just re deforestation or just soil erosion or they're one key thing and they don't look at the full ecosystem and realizing that they're all, every aspect is connected. Even if the United Nations 14.5% of greenhouse gases is the accurate number, that ignores the fact that the vast majority of desertification is coming from animal agriculture, vast deforestation is coming from animal agriculture, the water consumption, on and on and on. And so it's really important. It's like, say fossil fuels is the leading cause of climate change. It doesn't, <laughs> fossil fuels isn't the leading cause of deforestation. It's not the leading cause of water pollution, and on and on. So animal agriculture just takes the cake for sure. That's what I think is so staggering about it is just all of the different pieces of it which impact so many different facets of our environment. And one thing that struck me from the film was early on, you all illustrated the fact that the decision to not take so much part in animal agriculture is far more powerful than almost anything else you can do. You can ride a bike, you can get an electric car, you can lower the amount of water you're using when you shower, you can switch to solar power, the list goes on. But it still doesn't come close to the amount of change that you can affect by simply removing yourself from participating in, you know, consumption of animal products. And that's a, nothing else comes close. Again, you know, because removing animal products from your lifestyle 
touches so many different things, water pollution, water consumption, you know, again, I could, <laughs> I could list it all day long versus, you know, riding your bike is a great thing. And I'm a big advocate of, of cycling instead of driving, but that's really only going to affect climate change, air pollution. It's not going to have this broad reaching impact. And so there's nothing that we, we do that has such a huge impact as changing what we eat. Yeah. Let's dig into a couple specifically for a minute. I mean, one that you've brought up a couple of times that I think a lot of people aren't as familiar with is this thing that happens, desertification, this depletion of the soil. Would you speak a bit about, you know, what you're aware of as far as what creates that process and what does it mean when land becomes desertified? Yeah. So the leading cause of desertification is deforestation. So you have areas that are naturally supposed to be forest, they get enough rainfall and you clear that land to make room for agriculture, whether that's growing feed crops to feed animals, which consume more than half of the world's grain, or if it's to grow grass to, for those animals to graze on. Trees produce their own humidity, and they actually will change weather patterns. So they will create low-pressure systems and high-pressure systems, and they'll pull air in. So like the Amazon Basin is a great example. The Amazon literally pulls in air from the Atlantic Ocean and creates a huge amount of rain. So you have this you know incredible rainforest, largest rainforest in, on Earth. When you clear those forests, that humidity level changes, those pressure system changes, and it stops raining. And so the Amazon basin has been going through one of the worst droughts in recorded history currently because of, and you know, the massive Amazonian fires we were seeing is because of deforestation. It's, it's true that, yes, they're setting fire to the forest to make room for animals and to make room for agriculture. But one of the major reasons is it's not raining as much and because we're clearing forests. And so then you have an animal that comes and grazes, a non-native species, you know, cows belong in Europe and Asia and, and Africa to some extent, um, but domesticated cows, they are totally invasive to the Americas. And so the ecosystems and the soils and the plants, and the microbes haven't co-evolved with them. So it's very easy for these very large ungulates to completely disrupt an ecosystem. They graze too, too aggressively. And so then the plants can't regenerate fast enough. And so the soil becomes weak. Uh, and the soil will then wash away or can be blown away. And so uh, another great example of this is in the United States, the Dust Bowl. So you had prairies that had sustained very large herds of animals for you know, millennia, bison pre predominantly. You brought in this non-native species, this aggressive European species, human beings, and their livestock, and they decimated the land to the point that the soil was dying and part of that was from tilling but a big part of it was because they brought in these hoofed animals that had no place there and that almost ended agriculture and almost ended the united states so desertification is a major thing i mean dr richard openlander an environmental researcher who's featured in the film he talks about the big three he talks about desertification species extinction and climate change those are the big threats that we really should be talking about and so it's it's more than just climate change. It's more than environmental destruction. It's also this global depletion concept that we're depleting aquifers, we're depleting soil, we're depleting forests, and we're depleting ecosystems entirely. What is the impact of animal agriculture on species extinction? You know, for those who've maybe had some exposure to this idea, but somewhat limited, you know, how does it impact it? Why does it cause it so heavily? And what are the impacts of species extinction? What does that mean for our world and for us? Yeah. So there's been five major species extinctions in the planet's history. The big extinction people know about is the dinosaurs, right? 65 million years ago, 66 million years ago, all the non-avian dinosaurs died off. We're in the middle of one of the largest mass extinctions plants ever seen, the sixth largest mass extinction. And the primary cause of that is animal agriculture. It is, again, clearing forests, so you're destroying ecosystems that the animals need to live. It's tilling up soils. It's actively killing those animals, too. So, you, again, when you look at large predators like wolves, wolves were hunted to the verge of extinction because they were a threat to the livestock industry. We look at what's going on in the oceans. You know, three-quarters, according to the United Nations, three-quarters of the world's fisheries are collapsed, on the verge of collapse, or greatly depleted. So we're wiping out massive uh, ecosystems in the oceans with our desire to eat other animals. And then when you remove a species from an ecosystem, the whole system falls apart. So there's oftentimes in ecology talked about keystone species, so a species that that species holds it all together. And that's a, that's a true concept. You know, wolves are often called a keystone species because you remove wolves from the ecosystem. The elk and deer and moose overpopulate, and so they overgraze the area, and then the forests and the plants suffer, and then you have erosion, and the whole system falls apart, right? But the truth is, is that every species really is a keystone species. So 
I mean, I was just looking at a study yesterday where they looked at sea otters, that if you were allowed sea otters to come back to a pre-Columbian population in the Americas, that just bringing them back, they would predate on sea urchins and other animals that eat kelp forest. And when you remove those sea otters from the ecosystem, the urchins overpopulate, they eat the kelp forest, and those kelp forests, if allowed to come back, would be able to sequester almost half of all the carbon we've emitted since the industrial era began. And so it's just like, you know, it's wow. just one thing. You know, sea you could, otters. Yeah, you could look at a, a butterfly or a cricket, you know, the, some of the smallest creatures in our ecosystems that play such a pivotal role because it's all connected. And so species extinction is major. And, and sadly, it's kind of a snowball. It just builds momentum. And we can slow it down, but I don't think that we're going to halt the species extinction that we're dealing with right now. The only way that we're really going to do that is, is we'd have to stop animal agriculture. We'd have to, uh, you know, if we stopped animal agriculture, we'd allow more than half of the world's agricultural land to revert back to forest, to, to back to native ecosystems. And so then it would give an opportunity for those animals to recover. But without that, you know, we're not going to do it. And and a lot of attention when it comes to species extinction, it's the black rhinos, it's elephants, it's whales. Those are the species that get a lot of the attention. And then the attention is put on poaching. Oh, well, poaching is what's the reason why these animals are on the verge of extinction. And that it plays a major role, absolutely. I'm not arguing that. But really what it is is human encroachment. And people are coming into their ecosystem. It's like, yeah, well, why are they coming into their ecosystem? It's to graze their cows, to graze their sheep. And, and they don't want lions around because those lines are a threat to their livestock. So again, it really just all comes back to our desire to eat other animals. I remember I visited Peru and I was in the rainforest doing some volunteering and I saw a jaguar, a big, beautiful jaguar that had been shot and killed because he was grazing on chickens in the village and they needed the chickens to survive and there was no solution to their mind other than to, to kill this beautiful endangered creature. And yeah, I'll never forget that. And that's a sad reality. And, and I think that's a that's a, an important story, too, because that's an individual, right? Like, you see that jaguar as an individual who was just trying to survive in their ecosystem. But human beings that we want, you know, we can coexist very well with other beings. And, and we've shown that through our history. It's mostly in the last, last few hundred years when we've really industrialized agriculture. I think that raises a really good point, which is that humans used to eat a lot less of animal products. I mean, humans used to eat sparing meat and very little seafood unless it was local for them, I think, probably a hundred or so years ago, maybe less. And would you speak about, you know, your thoughts on if you're not ready to necessarily forego animal products altogether, maybe reverting back to the way things used to be to eat less is at least something because it's how we were for thousands of years. It's only recently that with industrialization that people are able to cheaply eat meat for every single meal. Yeah, if we look at particularly indigenous cultures, you know, which are often used as like the, not a scapegoat, but like, oh, well, indigenous cultures eat a lot of meat and they're, you know, the way true human beings are. But if you look at indigenous cultures, for the vast majority, their diet makes up less than 10% of it as animal products uh, or animal proteins. And so, and I, I live in the southwest United States, and the, the Hopi, the Yavapai, the Diné, uh, the people of this area, about 10% of their diet. And, and these are people who are often viewed as like, you know, great hunters. Um, the, the reality is, is that once we start getting over 10% of our calories coming from animals is when we start to see the really damaging health effects, you know, the high rates of hypertension, cancer, diabetes, uh, on and on and on, all the issues that we're dealing with in, in our modern lifestyle. It's when we exceed 10%. Um, so yeah, you know, you could, you could reduce your consumption down to below 10% and, and have a big impact that you could choose not to eat cows or sheep, which have the biggest impact for climate change. But I think that is in this belief that we have time and space to take baby steps. And the truth is, is that we are actually beyond the point of being able to take baby steps. It's like, and the other truth is, is that we're, we're not babies. We're big people. We can take big people's steps. And the big people's steps is, hey, we have to cut out animal products. We just, we have to. We, there's, there's not enough time, space, energy, land, wildlife left for us to do anything else but 100% switch. And then the other thing, too, is that, you know, there's a lot of times people will say, okay, well, I'm going to cut back or I'm going to choose to eat grass-fed or local or organic. And the reality is, is that according to an analysis done by Dr. Celeste Rao and the University of Illinois, that if we took all the world's grassland that was formerly forest that has been cleared to make room for grass-fed livestock, 
and allowed the force to come back, we'd be able to sequester 265 gigatons of carbon from the Earth's atmosphere, which is more than we've emitted since the industrial era began. And that's just getting rid of grass-fed livestock. So grass-fed livestock and the organic movement and the more, you know, quote, hum humane animal products really isn't a solution either. They take more resources and have a, a big negative impact. So I advocate for 100% veganism. And and a lot of people see that extreme and they say, oh, well, people aren't going to do that. And that, and that may be true, but I think that when we go to an extreme, it pushes the middle farther in that direction. If we only say, hey, meatless Mondays, then people say, okay, I'll do meatless once a month. And if you say uh, vegan, they say, okay, I can do meatless Mondays. So, Yeah, I think that's true. And I think the more people who make that choice, the just more visuals and stories that are told and seen and so that it becomes more normalized i think it's starting to happen and in the last 10 years i think there are a lot more vegans now than there were 10 years ago but a lot largely because of films like cowspiracy and books like eating animals by jonathan suffren fair and you know who just dug into these issues but i think once people see that it's not so difficult and not so alien then uh then maybe they'll be more willing to make that choice yeah it's um, easier than it's ever been i've been vegan for 24 years i've never eaten meat so i've been vegetarian my entire life it is so phenomenally easy at this point and simple um there's a misconception too that it's it's expensive and the truth is, is I've, I've traveled and lived around the world plant-based foods are the most affordable foods and virtually anywhere you go I, I think that we we should be looking at indigenous cultures in a, in a major way for a lot of things that we do and see what, what did they do how did they farm how did they live how did they build their homes and what did they eat and you'll see that well in the americas there was no dairy there was no domestication outside of uh, dogs and alpaca less than 10 percent of calories came from non-humans it was eating plants and it was eating local plants and and hey guess what it was also organic <laughs> So before we dig into some of the other areas that animal agriculture touches, I'd be curious to know if anything's changed since the film was released. I think the film was released in 2014. Is that right? And so, you know, how, are we seeing any kind of significant change or any kind of significant mitigation since six years ago, which, you know, in the, in the 21st century, six years might as well be 40 years with, with the pace of life. Yeah. I'd like to say that things have gotten better, but sadly things have gotten worse. Um, some of the environmental organizations that we took to task in the film who for not talking about this issue have changed and have started to begin to talk about animal agriculture. They don't advocate for veganism, um, which is a shame because that's what they should be. They advocate, you know, get rid of fossil fuels, which awesome, 100% behind that. So it should be, you should advocate for 100% getting rid of animal agriculture as well. But... No, you know, meat consumption continues to climb around the world, particularly in Asia, uh, China, and India, as their economic prosperity increases, their desire to live like United States citizens and Canadians, uh, which who eat some of the highest per capita amount of animal products, that increases. So it's really important that for everybody listening to this, and, and I assume most of your audience is English speaking, so potentially, you know, Canada, the United States, and Europe that it's really important that we stop eating animal products first and foremost because we're, we're going to have a huge impact on the planet. And for better and often to, most of the time for worse, we are also a cultural role model for a lot of the world and a lot of the world copies what we do. And so if we as a society decide that we're not going to eat animal products anymore, it allows other cultures to, to jump to that conclusion that much faster. And we see that all the time. You know, we, we see ideas and technologies where, you know, in the United States, for example, we had uh, no phones, went to landlines, then we went to cell phones. The continent of Africa has skipped the landline process and has gone straight to cell phones. And you know, the continent of mm -hmm. Africa has more cell phones than the United States does. And it's, we could do this, the same thing could happen with veganism. India, for example, is, is eating more and more meat, but they could very easily jump and go straight to veganism and same with China. So um, I think that there's a possibility that real radical shifts will happen. And the other <laughs> truth is, is that we're hitting the ecological breaking point where we don't really have much of an option left. We're going to be eating plants um, or there's not going to be you know, 7.8 billion of us on the planet. So there's something I really want to talk about and it's this idea of world hunger as this thing that just can't seem to go away. We don't have the solution. We don't have the resources. Um, where are the holes with that belief, especially as it relates to animal agriculture? Yeah. 
half of the world's grain is fed to non-human animals. So there's about 800 million people in the world who are on the verge of starvation. They're not getting enough calories every single day, or they're literally starving to death. You know, that's that's about one-eighth of our human population is on the verge of starvation. And the thought that we are feeding perfectly edible products to non-humans to fatten them up so that you know, Westerners and pre- predominantly Westerners can eat those animals' bodies is an atrocity. Because the other reality is, is that most of those 800,000 are children. And the thought that we would allow children to starve to death so that we could fatten up cows, pigs, chickens, and sheep is, is really a crime. It's a crime against humanity. We grow right now enough food to feed between 12 and 15 billion people. There's not even 8 billion of us on the planet. I'm not advocating that there should be 12 or 15 billion people on the planet or that the amount of food that we're growing right now is sustainable because I don't think it is. But the reality is is that we don't live in a protein-deprived world. We don't live in a a food-deprived world. It's an allocation issue. We're feeding the wrong beans. And then there's also obviously hoarding. You know, with the COVID-19, we're looking at um, new crops being tilled in uh, and products being dumped. You know, again, I'm not advocating for people to consume dairy, but there was, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons of dairy being dumped into landfills because the demand was down and they wanted to keep the price high. And so we see that as well, is that they would rather till in crops than feed them to people because they don't want the price of you know soybeans or wheat or alfalfa to go down. So that's a capitalism issue as well. But I think that at the heart of it is when people talk about, oh, well, we need GMOs to feed the world. It's like, no, no, we actually don't. We, we grow enough food to feed everybody. We're just feeding, we're not feeding human beings. I think that alone would blow so many people's minds just because the idea of world hunger has become just this thing that is always part of our lives that has been since at least our generation, you know, maybe the under the age of 35, 40, like it's like, it's just a thing and we can't fix it and nobody has the answer and it's not true. It's not true at all. Yeah. I mean, obviously it is a, it's a hugely complex issue. You know, you have, you know, the, the great famine in Ethiopia in the nineties, which was, you know, astronomical and just completely devastating. Ethiopia was still exporting grain to Europe to feed livestock there. And so that people, their own citizens were dying, but because there was more value on money by local governments and by uh, more federal government that people were dying because they wanted money over that. So it is a, a complex issue, but you take away animal agriculture and all of a sudden there's an incredible surplus. And if people move away from valuing money over human life, then there really is a, an availability for everybody. Yeah. And this even extends into this whole idea of overpopulation. We hear that all the time. It's a matter of it's too many people. It's too many people. But the amount of resources that goes into animal agriculture far exceeds the amount of resources that humans you know, directly consume, not as a result of animal agriculture. But I think there's a, st- a there's a statistic in the film where um, I think it's about seven times more pounds of food that animals are consuming than humans are. Um, yeah, it, it's it's pretty astronomical. So yeah, I mean, we're at 7.8 billion people on the planet today, but there's over 70 billion farmed animals, and they all need to eat. And so it's like, yeah, you can look at a cow. For example, a dairy cow consumes about 150 pounds of feed every single day. Human being, if we're lucky, we get about two pounds of food every single day. So yeah, they're, they're already animals are already out eating us, out drinking us. They're using more resources than, than we are uh, as human beings. Um, I, I do think human population is an important issue. I think that you know we can't all live the way U.S. Americans decide to live. If, if we wanted to live that way, we'd need two other planets. You know, there would need to be three Earths to be able to sus- just to support it, not sustain it, but just be like to continue to as business as usual. But yeah, human population, I think that we need to address both of them. I think they're both really important. I think we need to address all of these. I, I, when, when I talk about veganism and I talk about advocating for the environment, I, I'm afraid that people will see it as, oh, it's just veganism. No, we, we absolutely need to stop fossil fuels. We definitely need to look at population in a very honest way. But there is a certain hierarchy and there is a certain uh, stepping stones we need to do. If we stop animal agriculture, it buys us the time to be able to deal with uh, CO2 because you know, the vast majority of Greenhouse gases that are coming out of our animal agriculture are methane, nitrous oxide. Methane is 86 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than CO2 on on a 20-year time frame. And so that's a 
a really important part of the the issue is that we we could stop burning all fossil fuels the planet but because co2 stays in our atmosphere for about 100 years the planet will continue to heat up for 100 years even if we stop today but see but methane which is a short-lived greenhouse gas and highly potent if we stopped doing it we would see a mark in global temperature within 20 years and that would buy us the time to get us off fossil fuels so there is a certain order that we need to address things um, because yeah if we we want to try and keep global pop uh, temperatures down a certain range if we want to get, keep human population under a certain range um, and, the, and I do just want to touch on the human population thing because it is, it's very controversial. It's even more controversial than talking about changing diet because it, it's very personal. Um, and I'm not advocating for population control because that has a really horrible track record. What I'm advocating for and what science has shown us is that if we want to see smaller human populations, we have to see gender equality is that when you give young girls and women the same access to education, to jobs, to uh, money, to resources, populations drop dramatically. And so look at that. <laughs> Equality, equity in, in society creates a better world for all. Um, and so that's what I'm advocating for. It really just unceasingly blows my mind how, how many tendrils from agric animal agriculture go out. It's almost like this its own illustration of a holistic system where that one industry is just it's affecting everything it's yeah it it's a lot to take in we'll take a short break here have a stretch grab a cup of something warm to sip take a little pause and a brain break and we'll be right back with more from keegan So there's a whole element that we've yet to touch on yet that I definitely want to make sure that we speak about, which is the systems in place, which keep things the way they are. And there's a lot of pieces there, too. I think it starts in the film with the realization from you, Kip, the team, that these environmental organizations, which are supposed to be advocating for the earth, are actually avoiding this topic altogether of animal agriculture and its impact. And I'd love to just hear your version of that story, that experience of those alarm bells starting to go off and then just what you discovered, what you all experienced. Yeah, that's the the impetus behind the film is that Kip, my co-director, who's the protagonist in the film, starts to realize about how bad animal agriculture is. And so he'd, he'd expect, right, that all the large environmental organizations would be talking about it. And then when he starts to look, he realizes that, yeah, they're not talking about it. This isn't a forefront issue. And why? You know, if, if raising animals for food is the leading cause of Amazon destruction, why isn't Amazon Watch or Rainforest Action Network, why isn't that their forefront issue? And so we go and we ask them, and the responses are, are often comical because it's so ridiculous that it would be like talking about uh, lung cancer without ever talking about smoking. You know, you would, you would say, well, you have to address this. This is a major cause of lung cancer. Why aren't you talking about it? No, 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 we don't talk about that. And I think the reason why these organizations aren't is it's an uncomfortable conversation to have. Uh, they're afraid of losing donors. You know, when you start talking about changing diet, and I'm sure your your audience listening to this, if they're not already on this path, they're uncomfortable about this conversation because it feels really personal. And then there's also the reprisal from this industry. In the United States, the livestock industry is incredibly powerful. They can shape legislation. They can push through laws that don't benefit consumers in any way. The Oprah Winfrey trial that happened back in the 90s where a bunch of cattlemen from Texas sued her for a lot food liability or a food libel law. I think all those things play into it, but I think money is at the source, is that people are afraid of rocking the boat. Uh, and then also, too, is that these the people who are part of these organizations, they eat animals, and so how could they really say, hey, you guys need to stop eating animals unless they're willing to do it themselves? But, you know, if you look at, you dig into the history of some of these organizations, uh, Rainforest Action Network, for example, their very first campaign that, that launched the organization was a campaign against Burger King because Burger King was buying beef from the Amazon. And they made that wow. very clear connection. Uh, Lindsay Allen, who is the executive director of Rainforest Action Network, featured in the film when we interviewed her. She used to be Greenpeace's head of campaigns for Amazonian, Amazonian leather. So she knew, first and foremost, how bad the uh, impact of animal agriculture, particularly uh, raising cattle in the Amazon, was for the rainforest. And yet her organization wouldn't talk about it. They have since you know, created a small campaign but it's far from the forefront. They'd much rather talk about fossil fuels. That's a, that's a comfortable one because 
uh, it's not something that we feel personal, like that we can make a difference. It has to be institutional. And I think that's part of our whole political system in the United States is that nobody wants to take personal responsibility. It's them, those people over there need to change. Would you talk a bit more about the difficulties that you have experienced and seen and observed as far as people making dietary changes? Because I think you're right. The, the way we eat is very personal. We have attachments to our families, to our, our culture. And for a lot of people, you know, our heritage is, gets involved. You know, what are the complexities of changing your diet in this way? Yeah, I think you nailed it, is that it's, it's family, it's culture, it's history. You know, if, if you were raised by your mom, she fed you, right? And so when, so, and she fed you meat and dairy and eggs and everything like that. And so when someone says you need to change that, it's like almost like an assault on your mother on some psychological level, right? You're like, no, you're saying that my mom was wrong for feeding me this. And so of course that's going to bring up issues and pe- of course people are going to feel threatened by that and not like it. And it's not to attack anybody's mom. It's not to attack anybody's parents. It's, it's that, you know, your parents hopefully were doing the best they could. And with the knowledge they had. And so now it's about prevent, presenting that information on giving people the opportunity to make more informed decisions. And then, the, you know, the reality is, is that there's so many incredible people from around the world who have woken up to this idea that we have to stop eating animals and using animals. And they've adapted their traditional diets and their cultural diets to still be everything that they need them to be to hold on to their heritage without the animal products. And so no matter what your ethnic background, your historical background, your family background, you can, you can veganize anything. And then you too, you also look at the history of it. It's like, uh, you know, being here in the Southwest, there's a very strong uh, native influence and there's a very strong Mexican influence. And you look at the history of indigenous and Mexican, which is another indigenous culture, their food, it, there was no dairy. And, you know, people think about, like, Mexican food being cheese and, and all, meat and all this stuff. It's like there was no dairy, there was no cows, there were birds that people ate, but there was no pigs. It, well, this wasn't part of, like, a traditional diet. This is a colonial diet that has been forced on, you know, indigenous people of Mexico. And so I think it's going back and, and seeing those things. And then the other part of it is is that when when we look at our traditions with family, it's not that we're like the turkey at Thanksgiving is the thing that makes everybody come together. It's everyone's coming together because they want to see each other. They love each other and they, that's what they enjoy. The turkey is just a, an excuse. But you take away the turkey from it and it's all, hey, let's have a beautiful meal and let's all come together. People will say, yeah. It's like people aren't showing up just for that animal product. So it, it's, you know, dissecting and being honest. And then, yeah, just willing to have those conversations with loved ones. Um, And, you know, when people have open hearts and minds, they come around to it. I totally tricked my family one year and took my grandmother's pumpkin pie recipe and veganized it and told them after. And it was a scandal, but they actually, they kind of opened their minds a little bit to it. Um, And I'll always be proud of that little act of uh, (laughs) of subversion. (laughs) Um, So... For a moment, I'd like to just go back to some of the institutionalization of animal agriculture, just just to give people a sense of how deep it goes, because it goes deep. And, you know, maybe would you speak a bit about the food disparagement laws and how they've changed and they've basically evolved to make it even more difficult to say anything negative about any industry, I think, but especially animal agriculture and food production. Yeah, so there's a, a federal food libel law, which means which says that you can't say anything that you know to be false about a perishable commodity. And it's a way to per- protect an industry, right? You can't say those apples are poisonous if you know that those apples aren't really poisonous because that's just not fair and that's lying and on and on. So those laws exist. Those laws were used to try and sue uh, Oprah Winfrey and Howard Lyman, who is a fourth generation Texas or a fourth generation cattleman. And because he said, well, there's mad cow disease in the u.s meat supply which he could back up and so he won that lawsuit but yeah there's more pertinent laws like uh there's a number of states that have ag ag laws and these laws are written by the industry and these laws make it a uh, a criminal offense to document the atrocities being committed on animal farms both to the people and to the animals and to the environment and so there's activists for example in, in utah filming from a public road to a slaughterhouse who was arrested, and she was arrested under this animal act, these ag act laws. And then there's federal legislation, like the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, and this is a law that was passed under the Patriot Act, which makes it a uh, felony, a terrorist, you're charged as a terrorist, a domestic terrorist, for disrupting the business of an animal enterprise. And so disrupting a business could be you rescued a chicken from a chicken farm, 
that's disrupting a business, and so you are a terrorist. Um, that and people have served time for these things. Yeah, yeah, people have been charged. Um, there's a number of activists. There's a, a really powerful film uh, called The Animal People on Netflix, which is about the Shack campaign, the Stop Hunting to Animal Cruelty campaign, which is a group of activists who uh, seek to shut down a very large, notorious animal testing facility. And they were charged under the precursor of this, which was the Animal Enterprise Protection Act. Uh, and they all served time in prison, uh, up to seven years in prison. So the, there's these sort of laws that don't benefit, you know, people. Like they're not benefiting us as consumers. Why would why would an industry not want people to see what's going on inside these farms? And you know, why wouldn't a consumer, a cons- every consumer who eats these products, should want to see how are these animals raised, how are they treated? But this industry doesn't want us to do that because they know that when people see how horrific these animals are raised, they're not going to support it. And in some cases, I mean, Brazil is an example. People have lost their lives trying to disrupt this industry specifically. I mean, I'm so struck by the story of Dorothy Stang, which would you speak about the story of Dorothy, Dorothy Stang and, and also of the other activists in Brazil who have lost their lives because they stood up for the forest? Yeah, so over, over 1,100 uh, forest activists have been, have been killed or disappeared. And it continues to rise. You know, it's actually worse now than when we released the film. Uh, Dorothy Stang was a, yeah, as you said, a U.S. nun uh, who was murdered in, in cold blood because she was speaking out against the cattle industry. She saw she lived in the Amazon um, and saw what they were doing and saw what these ranchers were doing. And a rancher hired a goon to kill her. And and I think her story stands out. Yeah because she was a U.S. nun, and so she was this, you know, we could identify her as U.S. Americans, um, but there's also because she was, she dedicated her life to peace and to justice, and she was a, a very motherly character, right? She wasn't a young, radical activist. Um, and her story is just one, one of many. There's there's so many activists who, particularly in Amazonia, who are, are speaking out and, and, and fighting back against what's happening and they're disappearing because this industry is so powerful. And and why would you expect anything different from an, an industry that literally makes money off of killing other beings? What's the difference between a cow and a human? Yeah, you could kill that person. I, I, I'm responsible for killing millions of cows every year. What's, the, what's a couple of human beings to shut them up? So, yeah, violence begets violence. I'd be interested to hear your perspective on the fires on the Amazon that we all watched play out not too long ago. I mean, you mentioned it a bit as far as, I'm sure it was exacerbated by the fact that there just wasn't as much moisture in the air because the forest is being depleted. But, you know, what's your take on the cause of that? I think most of what we heard in the mainstream news was that it's it's a symptom of climate change, but there's a lot more underneath that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's up to 91% of all Amazon destruction in Brazil is connected to animal agriculture. And so what it's often mean when we look at rainforest destruction and deforestation, it's often viewed as about a logging issue, right? They're, they're clearing the forest to, to take the wood out. But there's not that much money in logging. And so most of the rainforest destruction, what they'll do is they'll literally just set the forest on fire to clear the land so that grass will grow so they can graze cattle. And But since it's tropical soil, they can only graze the cattle for about two years before the soil is depleted and they need to grow genetically modified corn, soybean, and use chemical fertilizers to get the soil to grow anything. But so, yeah, the big fires that were happening in the Amazon were connected to animal agriculture. They were set these, the forests on fire. The forests are drier than they've ever been, and so those fires were getting out of control. And then the Brazilian government also, for all of the damage and all of the economic impact, they want the forest cleared because they see that as an opportunity for new industry. If there's not forest there, then you don't have to protect it in the same sort of way. And it also forces the indigenous people off their land, which is something the Brazilian government has been very clear about not being in favor of the indigenous people, the native people of the forest. So they allow things to burn. And we, we see that all the time with ecological destruction. I mean, whether it's the deep water horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, they let the the well continue to pump oil into the Gulf because BP was going to make more money off of their insurance claim than they were off of the losses. You know, so it's, it's that sort of stuff where money just takes paramount. And if we as a society say enough, we're not, we're not going to support you anymore. We're not going to be part of this. Things will change because that's the only language they understand. I think it's important to bring back, though, that when we look at the destruction in the Amazon, that's one symptom of 
again, Europeans and European descendants desire to eat animals because 80% of all of the soybeans grown in Amazon are exported to Europe and the United States to feed the livestock here. So it's eating meat anywhere in the world, but particularly in Europe and the United States, is affecting rainforest destruction. <laughs> One thing I would really like to ask is, I mean, some of the information that you, you and your team by creating this film exposed is something that very powerful people don't want to be exposed. And if you're willing to speak about it, if not, no problem, but uh, just to hear about your experience navigating that and if you all have had to deal with any anything legally or anything otherwise as a result of making this film and telling this story. We were really concerned while making the film that there would be reprisal uh, from the industry. You know, we, the activists who have done a lot less have been faced prison time um, than exposing an entire industry. And Howard Lyman, who again was sued, he was a former cattleman, um, sued by the livestock industry, he said, hey, you're, you're putting your neck out there. You know, you're, you're putting your neck on the chopping block. If you keep going down this path, you keep shaking this tree, like it's, they're going to come after you. And so we actually discussed like whether we should keep going or maybe we should change how we talk about it um, if the, all of these huge environmental organizations like Greenpeace and Sierra Club aren't talking about this, maybe we are just these dumb kids trying to expose this and we don't know what we're doing. Um, but Kip said something really powerful while we were making the film. And he said, you know, our, he goes, our fear of, of, of reprisal shouldn't be anywhere close to our fear of not speaking up. Like if, if we don't speak up, if we don't do something, what's going to happen? And if something happens to us for speaking out, that's that's insignificant compared to the damage that's going onto the planet and to these animals. And so that we continue to, to keep going with the film. There have been um, some pushback from the industry. We do get death threats, but in the age of the internet, who doesn't get death threats? So we're, we're very fortunate to not have to have dealt with a lot of legal issues. And the reason for that is that our film is solid. We are backed up, peer-reviewed studies. You can go to cowspiracy.com and you can see every single stat, every single source, the original peer-reviewed research that we pulled those numbers from. And a lot of them are coming from the industry themselves or from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So it's like these aren't kooky, you know, hippie, tree-loving people who are coming up with these figures. These are, you know, researchers. These are universities. This is U.S. government and the industry themselves. And we're just using their numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I checked out the website and it's amazing how thorough you guys have been. And you really, you call out every single statistic that's presented in the film, which I think a lot of people will appreciate. And it's really clear. It's easy to digest. So if anybody's curious, certainly watch the film, but also like check out the website and you can, everything really is very solid. So as we wrap up, I mean, I'd love to hear about what the response has been to the film and how have people reacted from what you've heard and seen response has been phenomenal uh we released the film in 2014 uh is that right 2000 i think actually the first release was 2013 um we self-released it then leonardo DiCaprio heard about the film he's got a screener of the film and fell in love with it and took it to netflix for us and he said hey i'm going to be executive producer of this film which is just phenomenal right like he's yeah he's an a-list uh, actor who really believed in environmental change and he was willing to put his name on a really controversial film. And we're deeply grateful for him for that because that has propelled the film to a whole nother level. Uh, it's gotten a tremendous amount of attention. It's gotten a lot of pushback too, a lot of criticism, which is great because that's just more conversations, more opportunity. And, you know, if people hate this film, that's fine <laughs> because at least they're thinking about the subject and they at least have to dig deeper. If they want to challenge us on our statistics and our research, great do it because it creates more conversation around how damaging animal agriculture is they, they might say oh, well it's not it doesn't take 2500 gallons of water to produce a pound of beef it, it takes 1800 gallons of water and they say great cool thanks for bringing that up so now everybody knows that it that even the industry themselves says it takes 1800 gallons of water we've had literally tens of thousands of people reach out to us we had twenty thousand people sign up for our 30-day vegan challenge uh, on earth day that's amazing yeah so wow. we've we have had you know hundreds of thousands of people change their diet because of this film and who have to talk to us directly about it and obviously there's so many more people who have changed their diet who we've never heard from so 
I think the film has was right time and place. People are waking up. People want information. They realize they've been uh, lied to. They realize that this information has been hidden and they're ready for the truth. And then they also want tangible solutions. They want to make the world a better place. And, you know, we, we can remake the world for a better place. Like, that's, yeah. that's very real. And we do it every day. We do it every day. We have an impact um, for better or for worse. And we can make that decision if we want to make it for better. Yeah. Absolutely. I believe that a thousand percent, which is obvious <laughs> um, or should be. Um, and my final question is, you know, from where you sit, where's the hope in all of this? Because I think there is hope. I mean, like to see one option that can have so much impact to me is exciting and empowering, even if it's so challenging for a lot of people. And I just would love to hear, you know, where do you see the hope and, you know, how do you see a better world coming into focus through this lens yeah I've been a, an activist pretty much my entire life I was raised by an activist and I <laughs> I don't have any hope and I usually will tell people once I gave up hope I felt a lot better and people will <laughs> often laugh and they'll say oh that's bizarre but I used to be so tied up in the outcome that it would break my heart when things weren't getting better and it was crushing and it was just I was burning myself out because I had this hope that things would get better and then they weren't. And so I gave up hope. I said, okay, the world's not going to get better. Things aren't going to change. But I know today I can make a difference. Today I know I can not support the suffering of non-human animals. Today I know that I can not support sweatshops. Today I know that I can speak up for those whose voices have been silenced. Today I know that I can do something. I can help in, encourage someone else to look at the world in a different, more compassionate, beautiful way. And so I gave up all hope of the future and I just focus on what can I do today. And and that, you know, some people, they, that's not going to work for them. But for my my mental state, that has helped me a lot. I'm, I'm not tied up in it anymore. I do the good work because the work needs to be done regardless of what the outcomes are. You know, I actually love that because I think that opens the door to accept the fact that things are going to get very challenging and it's how soon it happens is sort of up to the change that we're willing to make and how quickly. But I think if you allow that in, you're more prepared to kind of choose, as you've said, to be part of the solution where you are now. And that's all any of us can do. You know, none of us can change the entire system single-handedly or in small communities, but the choice that we all make is what we have control over. And, you know, detaching from the outcome actually, I think is very healthy. So I actually really appreciate that point of view. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Keegan. I, I really appreciate what you guys have created and what you continue to do. And if we're exposing such just a huge thing that whether people take the information and act on it or not just presenting people with the information in this format i think is is huge so thank you i oh, appreciate it thanks for the opportunity to talk about it is there a book or film you can think of that totally changed your life you watched or read it and there was no going back your picture of the world had changed for me, one of those books was Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Fair. This book explores a lot of the questions that Cowspiracy does as well. And the book is shocking, sometimes disturbing, and also very inspiring, sort of like watching Cowspiracy. If you had asked me two weeks before I picked up this book if I ever thought I would be vegan, let alone vegetarian, for the rest of my life, I probably would have laughed. It wasn't even a thought in my mind. It's not that I ate a ton of meat, but after finishing eating animals, I became vegan almost overnight. And over 10 years later, I'm more committed to this choice than ever. For me, it's inspiring that we can make such a massive impact just by reducing or removing our consumption of animals and animal products. The data shows that there's no more powerful choice we can make to support the health of our planet and rethink our food systems so that all people can eat. And not everyone will make the same choice or the choice that I made, but I think it is important to ask ourselves what we can do. And that brings us to our three takeaways from today's conversation, what we call our three changemakers, which we explore every episode. Changemaker number one, change must come from us. 
One thing that was so clear to me after watching Cowspiracy, and I think you get it also from today's interview with Keegan, is that we can't rely on governments, industries, regulatory organizations, or anyone else outside of us to make and enforce change. Keegan told us about the environmental nonprofits who wouldn't even touch this issue because of a fear of losing donations, and politicians are massively lobbied by these industries. With animal agriculture, the choice to make an impact is fully in our hands. We don't have to rely on anyone else to make the change for us. Changemaker number two. Our current system is not sustainable, but we have the power to change it. According to research done by the Cowspiracy team and available on their website, someone who eats meat regularly will need 18 times more land to produce enough food for them than someone who's vegan. And the waste produced by 2,500 dairy cows is the same amount of waste produced by over 400,000 people. There are billions of cows on the planet. Think about that. With populations in China and India increasing their desire for beef and other meat, we simply can't keep this up. But we have the power to drastically cut back on our consumption of animals and animal products or cut it out altogether from our diets. Plant-based diets have never been more accessible. And there's the added benefit that plant-based diets have been shown over and over again to be much healthier for us as well. And changemaker number three, it's time to redefine hope. I think what Keegan said at the end of our interview was really refreshing, honestly. Of course, we have to believe a better world is possible. But sometimes it's helpful and empowering to just focus on what we can do. The rest is out of our hands, the way that the world changes or behaves and how quickly. And that can be freeing. This change all starts with individuals. With one choice, we can protect the rainforest, lower extinction of wildlife, protect our oceans, lower extinction of plant life, reduce greenhouse gases, reduce global warming, save water, feed more people, and improve our health. What's more exciting and empowering than having one choice that can do all of those things? And as momentum grows, change will come. Here's what you can do today. Watch Cowspiracy if you haven't, or if you have, find other books and films to engage with on this topic of sustainability and animal agriculture. Learn more. There's so much to take in. Check out Keegan and Kip's second film, also on Netflix, called What the Health, where they pick apart the storyline that we need to eat meat to be healthy and present the health benefits of a plant-based diet, which can help keep you motivated if you decide to cut down on or cut out animal products from your life. Our challenge for all of you today is to experiment with lowering your consumption of animal products. Go meat-free for a week. Cut out eggs for a month. Reduce dairy intake to once per day or whatever feels right for you. Make some reduction in the amount of animal products that you're consuming. Give it a test. See how it feels. If you're vegan already, our challenge for you is to choose someone in your life who isn't and start a conversation with them about animal agriculture. Use the 11 Madison Park announcement as an icebreaker. This world-famous restaurant going vegan, it's shocking for a lot of people. See what comes of your decision to open a dialogue. We'll share resources that the Cowspiracy team has created on our episode page for today's episode at wecanremaketheworld.com. Changing the way we eat is not something that maybe feels easy or simple but we have an opportunity to let go of something that flat out isn't serving our best interests anymore in order to make room for a new idea about what we eat and how we produce food and how to feed the world and so much more. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you feel empowered by what we've explored, and even if you're a little shocked by some of what Keegan shared, who wouldn't be, we hope you're committed to taking this new information and doing something with it, or reigniting your commitment. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to our show so that new episodes reach you right away. Leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening on, and tune in for our next episode in two weeks. Until then. Thank you.